Welcome to Hiring Happy Humans, where we talk about all things HR with a variety of folks, from CEOs to community partners, sharing up-to-date trends, best practices, and our wild workplace stories. Each interview is designed to leave you with the knowledge to keep your sanity. I'm your host, Dawn Sipley of Sipley the Best. Thanks for joining in, and let's jump into this week's episode. Welcome everybody to Hiring Happy Humans. I am just so excited to invite Daniel O'Leary here from Advanced Recovery Systems. Daniel and I have had the opportunity to know each other probably for about a year and a half now. Uh, We were first introduced through one another when he gave me a call out of the blue on behalf of Team Challenge. Uh, I thought he worked there. Evidently, he was actually one of um, their... What do you call it, Daniel? Student. Students. Okay. Students, residents, everybody uses different language around that. And I was just really impressed with with Daniel's transparency. His testimony is really touching. Um, We kept in touch through his his journey of of finding sobriety and really um, uh, achieving some amazing goals around employment and housing and all those things. And Uh, Just want to share a little bit of his testimony, but more so than anything, bring tools and ideas and and resources to small business owners, either for themselves or for their employees who may suspect that they are in some type of crisis, whether it has to do with substance abuse, mental health, um, or anything that's really affecting their, their work performance in a severe way that kind of touches on that. So welcome, Dan. I'm just so happy that you said yes to coming on my podcast here today. Thank you for having me, Don. I appreciate the invitation and um, to kind of, I appreciate the, uh, the, the, the kind words in the, in the introduction. So I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Just kind of as if we were um, chatting before we we hit the record button, I, it's just so remarkable to me to even see your tempo and the look in your eye. You you are not the same man that I that I met just a year and a half ago. Can you just share with me a little bit about your journey and and how you were able to finally really change your life ultimately? Well, I mean, I have to give um, the credit really for ch- the changing of my life uh, to God and to God alone. I mean, I. You know, it's through his grace, but through through all, through my effort that um, that I am not. You are correct. I'm not the same person I was. Um, next month, I will be celebrating uh, two years of sobriety after 20, 25 year, plus years, really, of um, of addiction and drinking and drugs and all the all the bad things in life. But um, my journey started like when you with when you knew me. Um, we actually met before that long ago in the Sanford Chamber. Oh, know. did we? Oh yeah. Oh, that's I'm right. Saying. That's right. We had we had said that. Yeah. yeah we had said that. Yeah, but um, I did. I, I, so November the tenth of uh, two thousand and twenty, I checked myself into Teen Challenge after um, really giving myself back over to the care of God, as I understand Him through. Um, I was arrested again. Uh, I was, uh, you know, in the Seminole County Jail, and you know, I did that that jailhouse prayer, and I I had this this overwhelming peace come over me that everything was going to be okay. Um, felt like God really did talk to me about that and uh, say that I was going to be fine. Um, but I also knew that this journey at this time was going to be um, was going to be a challenge, and it has been that. So, um, really, this last two years has been a complete 180. When I, uh, you would not have recognized me back then. Um, I was uh, looking, uh, you know, really to to end everything. I, I, you know, I really lost everything. I had lost another marriage. I had lost another, all the material things that you've had. And I've had, you know, great success in the, in the world of sales and and things like that, but always very roller coaster ride because of, uh, because of addiction, because of alcoholism. And, you know, there's underlying causes for that, but no, there's no excuses. It's um, childhood trauma to, to bad things, to PTSD, to all that stuff. But all that stuff is uh, is by the wayside at this particular point, and um, I'm I'm blessed to be to wake up every single day and and do what I do here, um, trying to bring that feeling and that journey to other people. Right, right. So um, you you had some childhood things that had happened. You mm-hmm. you served our nation through the military. I know there was an incident there that was was traumatic that caused some of that more severe PTSD. 
sales people, I mean, mm-hmm. the statistics behind uh, substance abuse among salespeople is pretty incredible. They're, they're higher than the, the average. Um, and, and you found yourself in a program and, and you got sober and then you were able to find yourself at advanced recovery systems. Um, share yeah. with me a little bit about advanced ARS is how we, we call it around here and, and what they do and how they serve. And then after that, I want to talk about how, how you're able to serve them specifically sure. in, your, in your role. So advanced recovery systems uh, began in 2013 with one center uh, for uh, substance use disorder in Umatilla, Florida, and it would say physician founded and physician led corporation. They saw in this in this space and in this in this this world really the need and um, the well need is the best best really word for it for a highly ethical client centric and evidence based program in order to deal with substance use disorder with the co occurrence of behavioral health. Substance use disorder walks hand in hand with many different other um, underlying conditions such as PTSD, depression, anxiety, uh, tra- you know, trauma. Thing. Oh, there's this, you know, name, name a thing. Um, and substance use disorder will definitely um, usually walks hand in hand. And what I like to say is it sort of metastasizes from something else and into its own its own disorder. And um, addiction is not is not. Um, something that is a is a moral problem it's something that becomes a a a physical uh, mental and spiritual need you need whatever your drug of choice is like other people need air um it's 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 an incredibly debilitating disease and our understanding of that has been um has been developing over so many years but it really is um something that people need treatment for so and that's uh what uh advanced recovery system does if we do have a full continuum of care underneath most of our roofs and we have nine facilities around the nation at this point and four here in the state of Florida. Um, we do have one outpatient center in Miami and then, then we have a full continuum of care in Umatilla, Florida, Orlando and Palm Beach. So we do medical detoxification, residential treatment, parcel hospitalization, intensive outpatient, which are both of those are with boarding and also an outpatient treatment. So that we do that in those three locations. We do that through our, again, we medical staff is being on staff, all the, all the places they're like little, they're like re- resorts, they're, they're just absolutely beautiful. There's a pool, there's a gym, there's different sorts of therapies, art therapy, music therapy. When I went to Umatilla, it was, you know, they had equine therapy, which is on hold because of the pandemic at the moment. Now, our, our clinicians that deal directly with our, with, our, with our clients or patients, whichever you know, name you want to call them, um, they're all at master's level and above. You know, we employ the different modalities of care that are evidence-based, such as EMDR to deal with, child, or, you know, with trauma and PTSD, to CBT, DBT, and mindfulness. All of them are introduced to a 12-step program, such as AA or NA. Um, if somebody has an, you know, a, a difficulty or a problem with the concept of a higher power, we have a cognitively based program for them. It's called Smart Recovery. So we don't close the door on really any um, avenue towards sobriety, but we introduce those people to a, um, a, a cornucopia, if you will, or a menu of different ways for them to get sober, you know, what path that works for them. How many times does the average person struggle with these things? How many times do they go into treatment during their lifetime? So that's a, that's an that's almost an impossible question to ask. Right. And what I can do is give an overview of of um, like the CDC will tell us that in right. in, a, in a person's what well, the population there's about ten percent at one point of their life will struggle in substance use disorder. So if that's you take all? population. That well, and I well, then I don't think that's very accurate. But then again, I'm not the <laughs> CDC. Right. Um, so, and I also deal with the Veterans Affairs Administration. The Veterans Affairs Administration says that in the veteran community, it's 20. percent I can tell you honestly, that's compl- that's woefully low. So, you know, it, it would depend on what your definition of struggling and addiction is, um, and that's a very sliding scale and subjective thing. So, but even if you did take it at the 10%, you're talking around 30 to 35 million people that struggle daily with substance use disorder. And that's one person. Now, now if you say the average person will have a family and they'll, they'll affect around 
10 people around them. So if you take 35 and then extrapolate it out by 10, that's the entire population of the United States that's affected by substance use disorder. Man, that's, that's just, it's mind boggling, honestly. It really is. Especially yeah. today, I mean, in last year alone, there was 107,000 overdose deaths in the United States. 107,000 people lost their lives. Now, I'll give you one statistics right here in Seminole County. Last last year in October, Narcan was, distri was distributed and used 337 times. So 337 times in one county out of 67 out of 50 states. And that was only the, you know, 330 times that people were saved. That's And that's usually just for opioids and things of that nature that doesn't get into alcoholism, that doesn't get into kidney disease, that doesn't get into drunk driving instance, that doesn't get into divorce, it doesn't get into childhood abuse, it doesn't get into any of those things that also all stem from substance use disorder. And uh, the statistics will tell us that 80%, 80 to 85% of people that are incarcerated are in their direct result because of substance use disorder or dealing with uh, illegal or illicit drugs. Wow. Wow. It's not, it's, a, it's not a small problem. It's an, it's an epic. It is not. And, and as an HR professional, I often watch business owners, HR departments really struggle on what to do around these circumstances. Oftentimes addiction is not the first suspect. Uh, they suspect more innocent, you know, things like them choosing to not come into work or being lazy or not paying mm -hmm. attention because, they're only looking at the symptoms. They really don't know what the root cause is of these things. Um, and there's such a stigma around it. And oftentimes I ask my clients, you know, do you talk about, you know, drugs? Do you do drug tests? Do you talk about mental health? What, what is your attitude towards it? And they're always really standoffish, even those that, that have personal experience with it. They almost say, well, we, we don't want to talk about that. And I guarantee you someone on their staff is, is experiencing either some kind of mental health situation that's, that's become a burden in their life and not allowing them to operate at their best or 10% or of them, you know, are, are suffering on a daily basis from addiction. That's some really wild numbers. So in, in the economy and in, in, in the business world, I also, um, I'm a, a almost just a test away from becoming a certified facilitator of addiction awareness. So also your, um, it, it costs billions upon billions of dollars to employers. And what they don't understand is that it is stigma and um, to, to kind of lift the, the veil a little bit. When people are calling out sick, many times they're not sick, they're, they're hungover or they're still you know, intoxicated or their performance suffers and, and X, Y, and Z. And that will continue on to a pattern to where uh, things will, you know, people will be terminated. It's happened to me. I can't tell you how many different times. I've had 74,000 careers. That's why I'm so eclectic with all the things I can do. Um, but the cost to the employer is you think that you're getting rid of a problem, but really what you're doing is you're getting rid of somebody that you have spent money on training, on hiring, um, the productivity out of that, that's all lost. And then you have to start all over again. Um, the stigma being lifted is being having having open and honest conversations and and not necessarily like, I mean, if somebody uh, fails a drug screen in a company, they're pretty much automatically terminated. Um, and that doesn't really that doesn't really solve the problem that really just just adds to the problem because that particular person goes could spiral down out of control or they could get another job and the problem can and then the problem is just perpetuated. So the the in for employers um, talking to somebody like me or somebody like you know that has that sort of experience to to look for um, absenteeism or poor performance or um, attitude adjustment things that you know you don't understand um, it usually is a sign of something bigger it could be mental health it could be substance use disorder but you you hired a person um, especially if they if it's if it's like kind of sudden or something like that there's usually something behind that. So uh, being able to have a, yeah, being, have, being able to have an open and honest conversation and also uh, people that um, make mistakes or they're stuck in substance use disorder, they're not going to come out and tell you because they know that they're going to be terminated. Yeah. What are some things that, that 
in either in your personal opinion as someone who has gone into work and acted either sober or not hung over and struggled through the day, I, I, I can certainly say that I, I've, I've gone to work more than once, you know, um, from a hangover or, or whatnot. And that's, that's why I walked away from alcohol when I turned 40. Um, and, and, you know, it, and it runs in my family and I just, I, it happened so slowly that I just wanted to prevent the opportunity for it to ever really get a hold of me in a severe, severe kind of way. Um, what I found from my personal circumstances during the season of my life, I was, I was employed by someone who celebrated alcohol. Uh, shots were done in the morning when deals were closed. Uh, bottles were no, popping okay. at, at four o'clock when on a Friday, every Friday, it was a standing happy hour in our business. And it was often touted by leadership that they didn't trust anyone who didn't drink. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was a real pressure in the corporate world. And, and, and oddly enough, even for for ladies to be able to drink like a man, to hold their own, to, you know, be able to do one for one and, and stuff. So, you know, it's so impermeated into our culture, into our corporate mm -hmm. atmosphere, into the mixers, into the networking. I mean, I can't tell you how many events that I've gone to that that I've ended up leaving just because. I didn't like the direction that things were headed after, after a certain time, you know, because everybody left behind is those that, that are enjoying uh, the libation. <laughs> so. yeah. And and that is part of the culture and it is part of like, I, I grew up, I'm, you know, an Irish, Irish Catholic and, um, you know, and then I was in the Marine Corps. So drinking was part of our, like, I mean, what? it was <laughs> just something that we did. Um, it was yeah. not something, however, um, you know, alcoholism and addiction is, is a little bit further than that. But um, again, people that celebrate that culture that don't trust people that don't drink, um, it's part of the stigma. It's part of the culture. It's part of something that you kind of have to, you know, I, I don't, at this point, I don't particularly care if you, you don't like that I don't drink or I don't do drugs. That doesn't really matter much to me. I mean, but um, it is. And, it, you know, for, for people to understand that Addiction is, has, you know, it's scientifically proven to have, you know, a genetic predisposition to it. It's part of mental health because of trauma that has happened in people's childhoods and post-traumatic stress and things of that nature that, you know, you know, coupled with a genetic predisposition and nobody sits there as a five-year-old in their driveway and playing with their, um, with cracker jacks or whatever and saying, I hope I grow up to be a, to be a drunk. Nobody right. does that. It doesn't work that way. Um, nobody you know, is, uh, is a young girl and, and wants to, um, you know, grow up to be somebody that walks the street because they have a crack addiction. Um, and some of these, these people that, you know, are looked down upon by society are broken in more ways than you could possibly imagine. They are the most marginalized people that you could think when you go by somebody that's sitting on the side of the road, you know, you know begging for change because they're, because they're a, uh, you know, they're an alcoholic or they're a drug addict. They, they're, you know, you look down at them as if they're nothing. And it, it, sorry, it's, it's really, it's really tough to deal. It's tough to deal with. And it's, um, and it is, it's this weird thing though, because it is a, um, it starts off with a choice to do it. Um, it does start off with personal responsibility and there's no, there's no excuse for the things that you do, but then there's reasons as well. And there's all these stuff. So it is this very complex rubric that is um, something that we work every every single day in order to try to uh, to alleviate. But, um, you know, the our culture, especially alcohol, I mean, we we, we look at it, especially the opioid crisis and, you know, fentanyl yeah. and, and all these. It doesn't things. always start off with the choice. Doesn't Many of those that are addiction, addicted to opioids were given it to them by their doctor. They were using them in a, an appropriate like, manner. And, and next thing you know, they're buying heroin because they can't, they can't get any more, they can't get right. any more oxycodone and they can't get any more of this or they can't. And uh, it's, it's an amazing, it's, it's an amazing, um, just, just unbelievable unreal like you don't know what road is going to take or end up being um i like to uh, something i use as an example is uh, i found 
the ultimate thing that is the ultimate um, uh, level ground or it, it doesn't care who you are, right. doesn't care the color of your skin. It's the absolute, uh, you know, thing there where it doesn't care what, you know, who you love or who you call God. It doesn't care. But the bad thing is that it is addiction and it wants to kill you. Um, because that's where it end up, ultimately ends up. But a lot of the different programs will tell you there's only a couple of different places that you're going to have. It's jails, institutions, or death. I have been to all three, and I was right on the doorstep of, you know, of taking my own life in, in several different ways, both subconsciously and consciously planning it. Um, and coming back from the absolute brink of that um, is something that uh, is is a real miracle of God. And I, I, I I'm... I'm blessed to just be alive. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I personally have experienced this stigma. I, I grew up around a lot of drugs and, and alcohol. And unfortunately, my mom lost her life at 44 um, due to an overdose. She had been to a bad accident because she was drinking and driving, mm -hmm. sadly enough. And um, back in 2005, we didn't know what we know now about um, Oxy and some of those other drugs and whatnot. And I always as a 23 year old young lady, you know, that was young to lose a mother. And, um, you know, when it would come up in conversation, people would, would be aghast, you know, oh no, what, well, what happened? And as soon as I said that she overdosed their, their whole face and demeanor mm -hmm. would change and they would go, oh, well, yeah, you, she did it to herself. Fire. And it's like, well, my grief is, is nonetheless, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> any different. I, and I lost a sister. I lost one of my sisters to an overdose. I, and I've lost, especially when you live in the world of, of recovery and, and you, I've good seen friends. so many people, mm -hmm. um, so many good people that, that are no longer here. Right. Um, and then, you know, when you, when you, you see people again, like, when I walked out of the last time I walked out of the Seminole County Jail, and I did, I had to walk from Seminole County Jail to Castleberry, which was was a very long walk when in flip flops. So, um, I remember walking down the street, and I remember seeing people behind street sign or uh, behind signs and behind bus state bus bus stops, and um, and I remember having a choice in my head. I said, "Can I can either um, change yeah. my life?" Or I could become like that. And I still feel guilty for thinking that I could become like that. Right. Um, those people are human beings just like you and I yeah. are. God's yeah. got a plan for them just like he has for you and I. Mm -hmm. And um, for us to ever um, judge anyone like that, um, we're really just judging ourselves. Yeah. And what, what I found um, through conversations with folks and stuff, it, it's always, it's always funny, you know, cause people, some people know my car, colorful background and childhood uh, stories and things like that. And they feel very comfortable talking with me with a wide variety of things. And it's like these days, soccer moms are doing mushrooms and watching <laughs> their kids play soccer and, you know, medical marijuana is free and it's, it's passed out at, you know, in restaurants and bars, like, like their Tic Tacs and, you know, protocols aren't followed and, and things like that. And it's just kind of this, this underlying, you know, kind of beast. Do you think that the, why, why is there a stigma when it absolutely touches every single one of our lives? I don't know a single person who doesn't know someone who struggles with alcohol or drugs. Big, big, well, I mean, is it because we fear it because we know? I think it's because if, 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 Everyone that truly had it, an issue with with substances such as alcohol or drugs, mm -hmm. if every one of us really admitted that, um, then it would be most it would be most of us. Um, it would be most people have some sort of issue with it. And like I just said, you know, um, a woefully low um, ten percent of the population, but it touches us all. Um, Every, you know, if every single person really admitted that every time they did something stupid, it was probably when they were, they were intoxicated. Yeah. Most people don't do dumb things unless something has lowered their inhibitions or, or something like that. The stigma, I guess, comes around because it, um, culturally, they think that, you know, if you can't handle your liquor, you're weak or, right. um, I could handle my liquor better than anybody. I was an expert at it, you know, um, and until I couldn't. Right. Um, I, I truthfully believe that, you know, in all things, um, alcohol is the most insidious one. 
you know, uh, by far, because, I mean, it's not only socially acceptable, it's socially promoted and it's readily available and completely legal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's un it's unbelievable. And you can't even start to to imagine the 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 pain. You know, I've lost two marriages and I've lost, you know, fa my families and I've lost houses and I've lost so many things that I've lost. Um, and it all really stems from, from alcoholism, but um, why the um, the stigma? Mm -hmm. It's it's a socially acceptable thing to do and a socially promoted thing to do. Right. Um, you can't um, you can't really undo that until you start talking about it. Until you, you see people that well, and also uh, it, it goes into um, like even the programs of recovery that we're usually used to of AA and NA, the second part of the, you know, the of those uh, those acronyms is A or anonymous. So even if you recover, you're supposed to shut up. You know, even if you're, even wow. if you're, if you finally come about and you've changed your life around, shut your mouth. You're just, you're, you're one of those weirdos that can't do it. It's complete nonsense. It takes I never strength. noticed that. That is, wow. I mean, wow, truthfully, wow, wow. that says a lot, right? Because society doesn't want to hear it. They want to, they want to, they want to talk about it. They don't want to, they, they, they just feel like, you know, you're something, there's something wrong with you. Like, well, do me a favor and, and replace the word addiction in any sort of conversation, a medical conversation, or replace it with, with cancer or uh, diabetes or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, the conversation completely changes. Oh, yeah. Well, my, my son has cancer. My son's an addict. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sympathy no. just isn't just isn't there. I always find it curious when I am in, in social events, um, how upsetting it is my sobriety bothers, you know, others. And well, well, why? They have to know why. I was like, well, I, I don't smoke tobacco either or dip or that's, well, <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Well, we why would you, you know, I don't I, do a lot and of for, <laughs> for many people, it's not a big deal. And they have, they, they can have a drink or two and it's right. not even something to where they, it, it doesn't bother them. Um, right. And, and, and super for you, dude, like, hurrah, like have a, have a blast. I don't really, you know, it's, it's just no, not something care. to do. Yeah, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. I, I, I still know. enjoy the bar atmosphere. I still go to bars and, and have soda. I, you know, the sad thing mocktails. is at this point, so do I. Right. None of that bothers me. Mm -mm. Um, yeah. It's been, it's been, you know, when I, when I say uh, I've been um, radically changed by God's grace, I don't, I, that's not, that's not a, that's not lip service. Right. It's yeah. been removed from me. I just yeah. don't care. It doesn't bother me. You could drink in front of me. You could have a, you could do whatever it is. It's just not something I'm going to do. Not my temptation. Not right. my thing anymore. I don't, I don't bother me. And um, again, I, I really goes back to, um, you know, people not wanting to talk about it, people, and even people that do find recovery, you know, just go over there, you, you bunch of, bunch of, and then it, I, I'm not a, I love uh, the guys and gals that are in AA or NA. I think that if that's the, the program to keep you sober, then that's better than not being sober. So, but then again, you can go stand on your head and drink pickle juice. If that keeps you sober, super duper. Um, it doesn't really, you know, as long as you're not doing what, what you were doing. Um, right. I, I don't, I don't, I never did um, get along with the, the anonymous part of it. And I won't shut up because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's why there's so many people out there because they think that there's something wrong with them or they're broken in some way. Right. And they are, but there's also people that have overcome that through, you know, for me, it's faith for somebody else. It might be something different. I mean, it could be, you know, going to the gym, it could be an AA program. It could be painting. I don't know. I mean, whatever, whatever it takes. Um, you know, like in our company that we don't, don't shut the door on any, any path of sobriety whatsoever. So, right. right. Now, what are some things that employers that you see that they do well in, in responding to addiction and what are some things that they just do really poorly? Like as an employer, if I suspect that one of my employees is struggling with alcoholism or is using an illicit drug like what how should that be approached from your point of view not an hr point of view but as someone who has gone through that what kinds of conversations are are helpful and what kinds of conversations or actions are not 
So the first and foremost thing I believe that you have to do is you have to stop and, and, and recognize that if somebody is doing something, um, you know, using drugs or alcohol, that they're going to understand that if they if they come forward or if the conversation is going to be had, that usually ends up in, in disciplinary action or a termination. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that's got to go. Mm -hmm. um, you can't you can't possibly think that people are going to come forward and talk to you if you're right. going to fire them. Right. I mean, that's just. There's just madness. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. And then it does, it perpetuates the problem, not only for you, but for them. So uh, having, having people, um, again, somebody, you know, I don't know, not me, or somebody like me that's been there um, that you can probably maybe call on or um, you, it's a pattern of behavior. I mean, if somebody does something, you know, you, first off, if it's alcohol, you can, you can usually tell, you can smell it, see it, you know, how, how they are. It's not usually something that you can hide um, or if it's, you know, absenteeism or poor performance, you know, have an open and honest conversation with them. And, and, and when you first sit down with them, you go, OK, listen, this is what we've recognized. And no matter what you tell us next, there are there are going to be no repercussions as long as you're honest with us. Mm. As long as you come clean with us and, you know, you're, you know, whatever it may be, um, we know that we'll get you help. You know, because there is so much help available. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll do what we can. And, you know, but and of course, there are, that there's a there's a point where you can't do that either. If people are, are being dishonest and you do have to take action. And that's, you know, obviously understandable. But that first conversation should be. Just tell us what's going on. Right. You know, we obviously know that there's a problem. You've missed six days in the last month. Mm -hmm. You know, and if it's it could be a medical issue, that's obviously not so if it's a medical. So if somebody misses six days and you find out it's because, well, they were diagnosed with, you know, whatever. Right. Are you going you to terminate have a doctors? No. Right. Are you, are you going to terminate them? No. Right. It's yeah. against the law. Right. But if you find out that they missed six days because they've been drunk, they're going to fire them. Is that that and so but it and in being drunk, it might be alcoholism, and then alcoholism is a medical condition, right? Yeah, at least according to the AMA. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, would could an employer, out of curiosity, call ARS and say, Hey, I have an employee, I suspect something, like, how do, how do I send them your way? Like, what they need help, like, well, what, what resources can an employer provide? Because, of course, they can't. Advanced Recovery Systems doesn't do that. We are we are a, we are a treatment program. Yeah. Um, you would have to find somebody like me or call me. Uh, I can okay. do that. Like that, um, that would be independent of what uh, Advanced Recovery Systems. So it, when Advanced Recovery Systems say steps in, somebody comes and does a substance use disorder, you know, assessment or something like that, or they, you know, you have a trusted peer or somebody walks in like a certified professional recovery coach. Or there's there's a lot of different. Um, titles or just somebody that was a drunk for 25 years that you can't really pull the wool over my eyes. I know right. you can't tell me, like, you can't lie to me because I'm just like, yeah, I, you know, I, I get it, buddy. Um, and if they say, listen, um, you can find help and you can offer them help. First off, we like what well, program like ours, we take most commercial insurances. It's a very, it's a very rare that's something I wouldn't take an insurance for. So but our major medical would would provide payment for the treatment. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Your medical insurance absolutely provides treatment. That's what we that's what we run on. Um, now I, I do mostly veterans affairs now. And that's VA benefits and that's through Optum. But um, you have your your employer's insurance will cover treatment. You know, okay. ninety. I I don't I can't remember the last time that I we found some uh, like there's one or two insurances just off the top of my head. Very very. Um, small, like not a lot of people have it, but that we won't have it. But um, most major medical will cover it. So okay. if it's covered under their medical insurance, find them help, you know, or encourage them to go to an AA or an NA or well, whatever. Um, and, you're, and you have facilities here in Eustace and Orlando. And so it's it's very local then as well. I have facilities in Umatilla, Orlando, Palm Beach, and an outpatient center in Miami. Now, um, it's not a problem though with, with, but no, and again, I we just opened up in Atlanta. We have one in Maryland. We have one in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. We have one in Columbus, Ohio, one in Colorado, and one in Washington State. Um, but one of my jobs, one of my um, 
by marching orders, if you will, is say that even somebody who does not have resources calls me, I still find them some place to go. I'll find them a faith-based organization or a, an organization that's nonprofit, someplace that they can find help. There's always help. We can find, you know, no matter what, if you have absolutely nothing, you're on the street with not just the clothes on your back. I can still find you someplace to go. And I will. And, and, I, and that's not only something that we, we're not just in this um, for the monetary gain. Right. We are in this to save lives. There's a big neon sign right outside of my office. It's, it's saving lives. It's what we do. And we truly mean that. And then uh, I am absolutely very, I'm very proud to work here. I really am. Mm. So um, we will leave your contact information in the description of this video. So with this, we have permission to reach out to you directly yeah. if you know someone that might want assistance in this area. That's, that's my job. Okay. Okay. It's not, it's not. So when I, when I talk to people, it's not, it's not a job to me. It's the mission in my life. It's why I lived through it. It's why I had 25 years of, um, have not made it's not wasn't very fun believe me and even like it looks back and like oh that was a good time i didn't really want a good time it sucked <laughs> fun so, but that's why i lived through it is so i can well, like, sin, sin is fun. the consequences not so much <laughs> yeah well <laughs> agreed so, um okay uh so so major medical can help pay for this. We Absolutely. will have your contact information to be mm -hmm. able to reach out. We can, we can see things, we can smell things, we can ask questions. We cannot just put down consequences as employers because so, of this. So those are some really good things to kind of guide us by, right? Yeah. The very first thing is that you're going to, you're going to recognize patterns of behavior. Okay. I mean, especially now. What if they come to you already a little what if they, what if you meet the person already in an active addiction and, and that's, well, and that's the thing is like, there's, mind. there's many of us that are very good at hiding it. And believe me, there right. was for most of my careers, you couldn't, you would have never known. Um, and you, you, I mean, there's nothing you can really do about that. I mean, you just do the best job you can. You can have the open and honest conversation with a company, uh, presentation or something like that. And, um, you know, put it out there that, you know, your first, um, I don't want to, I don't even want to call it an offense, but the first instance or the first conversation is basically, listen, um, you have, you know, the, um, you know, a mulligan, if you will, hmm. to come in and, 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 and get help and that the company will assist you. Financially, it makes more sense for you to do that to rather right. tend to terminate, rehire and retrain. Right. It makes more sense for you to let, and again, it is a it is a recognized mental and medical condition. So it's a it's it's going it's more along around those ADA violations because I'm seeing more and more litigation around um, these things and people, you know, there there is such a source of shame in stuff around. So people usually don't come back and say, "Hey, I lost my job because of my medical addiction," which happened to be you know, my addiction to cocaine <laughs> kind of thing. But if they have to go to the hospital to detox, to save their life, that's no different than have their gallbladder busted and they had right. to get it out and they were out for three days, you know, so. Well, and it's, and it, so there's legal ramifications that people don't really start to think of. And that's, that is becoming more prevalent, but right. it's also the right thing to do. It's not right. only the right thing to do yeah. as a human being, but it's right. the right thing to do for your business. You, when you when you hire somebody, okay, you've made the investment into them, and they've made the investment back into you. Mm -hmm. So you may, I'm sure that most people that that utilize your service services or hire at all, um, do the best job they can to select the best candidate they can. Now you, you're not stupid. You made a good decision. You did the best job you could. Right. So if at that point that you start to notice some things, or X, Y, and Z. It it behooves you to put the put the time in in order to to figure out what is actually going on instead of having to go through that process again and perpetuate a cycle that, you know, is going to cost you money in the end. It could cost you money in litigation. It's going to cost you at least it's going to cost you lost productivity. It's going to cost you, you know, rehire, retrain. Um, you're going to you know, and then if you're if you're just doing the same thing over and over again, you know, it, it's. It, it, they perpetuated through your own business as well. 
So, you know, having somebody come in and, and sitting them down and be like, listen, we've noticed this is the pattern of behavior that we've noticed. We're going to send you out for a drug screen. And then normally what would happen, especially in today's society, is you come back and you you test positive for cocaine or you test positive for marijuana, mm -hmm. you're fired. That's stupid. Yeah. Why, why, why even waste when, when, in your opinion, because a lot of people are going to wince at that, um, you know, in you your want. opinion, when is it appropriate for the employer to say enough is enough? Oh, okay. So that's what I'm saying is that first conversation that you have, okay. you offer help, you, right. you say, we're going to send you out for a drug scan. We know we, 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 and then they come back and they failed it. Okay. You can get help or you can, or you, or you're choosing to self-terminate. That's, you can see okay. what I'm saying? Right. So it's, and the then, oh, and then it, it's the consequence of the choices. Absolutely. Around that. Yeah. Because okay. addiction is addiction is a, is a two way street. It's, it's a, 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 a mix up of personal choice and a, not a choice. But you do have the choice to stop as long as help is offered. And then many of us, you know, the, the, it took a lot. You know, I'm a pig headed Irishman, so it took a lot for me to finally give it all up. But. Um, if somebody would have came to me, I don't know, and I can't say that I wish this happened because I wouldn't be the person I am today and I couldn't do the things I do now. Mm -hmm. So the past is not something I truly, I don't regret it anymore because it made me who I am. Um, given a magic do-over. <laughs> yes. If I did, and I could, and I, if I could have not done that. If we could right. not suffer. <laughs> but if somebody would have came to me and said, listen, this is what it is. We want you to get help. And here it is. And we're going to invest back into you, man. That would have meant the world to me. Right. The amount of loyalty that you would gain out of someone to say, I'm yeah. here and I love you anyway. Like, yeah. wow. Yeah. And how many more human. Think about this, though. Think about, say, that you have an employee, you know, they're a great person. They're super productive. And then all of a sudden their productivity just starts to wane a little bit. You're like, no, OK, what's going on? And then start some absenteeism starts going on. You're like, I don't really understand that. You notice that they're they're a little disheveled. They don't look as sharp. They're just something's wrong. Um, and you notice this over a period of time, mm. and you're like, okay, well, should I do anything or shouldn't I? Have the right. conversation. Right. You know, just be listen. And then it, you know it could be depression. It could be mental illness. It, it could be one of those things. They might just need somebody to, to reach out and help them. But at the end of the day, what were you, even if they're even if they if they beat the drug screen and they continue on and then they, it's become this, they become a problem employee instead of you reaching out and saying, listen, you have this chance to reach out and get help. Mm -hmm. What would that mean to them and what would it mean to you? What would it mean for your bottom line to have them back at the level that they were before they started sliding back down? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I know you don't have any regrets, but what is one piece of advice that if you could tell your younger self professionally, because <laughs> this is an HR, an HR thing, just professionally around all of this, like what, what would you want the younger you to just really know and understand? Um, you know that you didn't, that the things that happened to me, the, the things that were outside of my control didn't define who I was. Right. And it didn't, it didn't have to, if, if I would have, if I'd have, uh, if I'd have accepted and gave that over at a younger age, then I would not have probably gone down the road that I did. Yeah. Um, if I, cause I've always been sort of, you know, if I would have if one lesson, if I, course if i'd have listened to this and if i'd have never picked it up i would have never been a problem now that probably wouldn't be something that most people will do but i can tell you um the piece of advice i would say is that you know the things that were done to you um don't define you yeah wow wow the things that were done to you don't define you how many people wrap so much of their identity around their trauma around their experiences, around their labels, you know, I, I can certainly say I've been guilty of that. So I think that's one of the, the best answers I've heard on my show yet. <laughs> well, I mean, it's going to be hard, right? But it doesn't have to be tragic. 
We're going to suffer, but we don't have to like multiply our own suffering. And I think sometimes we get down and then we just, we double it up on ourselves. Well, life, you know, we're not, we're not meant to not suffer. That the right. life, life is, life is tough. No, um, right. The, and that's, but our suffering does not have to define us in, in, in my, in my faith and in my worldview, suffering is a pathway to peace. Mm. You know, it's not like my life is without hardship now. Right. It, it certainly has its hardships. It's, I mean, it, it has certain things that make me absolutely cringe, but I accept that. I accept the things that have happened and I accept the things that I have to, to burden. Mm -hmm. And I accept that suffering as a pathway to, um, to being a peaceful person. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to make me angry. Mm -hmm. You know, when I sit there and think about that, you know, the things that happened to me don't have to defy me. And I don't, you know, your anger and you know, a lot of it brings back, goes back to anger. You know, what people, people are, are mean to one another. Um, people can be nasty to one another. Um, and you know, being being um being kind costs that costs you absolutely nothing, right? So, and, um, and workplace bullying is really just such a real thing. I mean, toxic work environments, workplace bullying, celebrating around alcohol, you know, all those kinds of things. Just we can keep our workplaces at a minimum safe environments. I think if you can just do that, you're going to be an exceptional employer, be able to hire to your pleasure and, and really choose the best candidates because you're known of being an employer of high character. Again, I, I honestly think that when you start having like there's um, like you can you can hire people to come in and do a presentation on, on, on addiction awareness. OK, mm -hmm. you first have that that conversation and you put a policy in place that says, OK, if you are struggling, you can you can talk to us and you can right. come in and you can we'll, we will facilitate you getting help again it will it, in the end it's it's good business but it's what you should do as a human being right you know again right. you've you've invested in the people and they've invested back into you and your business is your business and you're not in business to um to not make money that's 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 what that's what we do this for stuff for um but your your responsibility to your employees mm. as a human being and as a business person is elevated by you being able to go out and saying this this particular thing that the understanding wasn't there 20 years ago of what it is and what it truly is so it just didn't understand it so it's not like like the past is like you know oh like you know or, oh what was it's it's okay, it's okay but right now i mean you can say listen you know if you have a, a an issue you know, you have health insurance. We we can we can we can rather not have you for thirty to forty five days as you go through a program, and then have you back at full strength instead of having to go through this entire thing, perpetuate a cycle that's not only going to destroy human human beings and you know the families, but then it's you know every person that is stuck in this again touches at least ten people, mm -hmm. and I could tell you you know the 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 path of destruction that my own life has has left behind it. And um, it was a hell of a lot more than 10 people, you know? So, I mean, yeah. That, so you have the opportunity not to, to, to do something different. And um, I, I've for many years now have seen employers as shepherds of their sheep, you know, mm -hmm. and, and should have a not on my clock mentality about protecting those that are in their guard. And sometimes it's from themselves. You know, because th if they, they may stay or they may go through whatever addiction or mental illness has done for their employment, but your interaction with them in that season could save their life or it's even lives of their children. The generational <laughs> effect of mental health uh, yeah. crisis and and stuff that it's it's unfathomable the ripple effect if you really m sat down and kind of mapped it out. You Ten don't know number. you don't know what you don't know and what will happen with um if you if you terminate an employee, you know, what I mean, how many times have you heard that employee is terminated and then the catastrophe after what happened? I mean Oh, I, I've I've had more than one, you know, I've been in HR for over 20 years and mm -hmm. you know, the hardest call is is you know when something terrible has happened, especially after termination. And I've mm -hmm. had 
employers and business owners get out of business because of suicides of their employees, because of the way they had interacted previously, they really took that that role on. I don't think they understood the gravity and the impact and the influence that they had on their employees' lives. And when they terminated them harshly or in a violent, you know, mean mm-hmm. manner, it's just what pushes that individual over the edge. And certainly, yeah, you're frustrated as a business owner, you're disappointed, you're, you are mad and, and all of those things. But, you know, character is shown, right? When you act in a way that that is above what is deserved. You know? Not only that, think about this for a second. The, what, what just popped in my head for some odd reason is the, the, the insanity of, the, of a zero tolerance policy. That's just nuts. I mean, because that's what happens to people. Like they make a mistake and they're immediately terminated. Now, there are things like violence or you know harassment or things like that. that there's, you have an obligation to protect other people under exactly. your- Exactly, and then, and, then, and, then, and then substance use disorder can, can certainly um, bleed into certain things like that. However, if it's somewhere where you can step in and offer help instead of offer a termination, right. as a human being, why would you not do that? Right, have the like, conversation. Why wouldn't why would you do that? Like, why, what would be like, oh, we caught you smoking marijuana and um, now you're now you're fired. And yeah. what will happen from that? Or well, you know, we caught you smoking marijuana, and you can either choose to get help, right. and we'll test you. And you know, you could even you know whatever, or you know, charge them for the test. Like, who cares? You know, whatever it may be. Or we caught you drinking on the job, or you came to work, or, or whatever yeah. the whatever the example may be. And you can either get help, and we will help you through that, or you're or you're choosing not to be employed. So you're you can I you then that then that becomes that that's the responsibility part of it because it has to it has to be a person's choice and it has to be a person's responsibility but not the the zero tolerance policies it's just pure it's, it's pure stupidity in my in my opinion just have the conversation at least find okay. out where where they're at and and all these things can be implemented in the in the handbook they can be a part of the culture as far as what leadership talks about how they handle situations when they do come up because the employees are watching I mean, to see how management call, responds to other people's crisis call, and if you're- call me and call me and have a conversation with me and like like I can tell you like exactly what what we're talking about right now I mean and and you know your culture is you know, if you're, again, it, it's, it's, you'd rather just have a conversation rather than sitting there and, and you're not, it's that weird thing because, you know, you do have a responsibility to protect other people and to protect your business, but, you know, you're, you're existentially doing that by having a conversation and, 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 and mitigating things that could, could occur by offering help instead of offering somebody, you know, right. the door. Yeah, Absolutely. So Advanced Recovery Systems, Dan O'Leary. Dan, thank you so much for for coming on the show today. If anybody has anyone in their life that they know and love and and may think that this is a conversation they would like to have, share this podcast with them. Uh, Dan's contact information will be in there. Uh, you You can get a hold of him. I know he will he will help you and guide you if it's not through ARS, maybe another system that's that's more appropriate for you. So thank you so much, Dan. It's been my pleasure, Don. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye, guys. Bye now. Thanks again for spending time with us today. If you want more HR stories and resources, go to simplythebest.com to join our newsletter. That's S-I-P-L-E-Y. Until next time, stay happy.